part three of our Prophesy the Promise series. How many of you are ready to prophesy some things? Anyone ready to prophesy some things? Am I freaking anybody out right now? Okay, if you're new to Discovery, I want you to be at ease, you know, you don't have to be a, you don't have to be a prophet to prophesy. We're learning that in this series, that we can actually declare those things that are not as though they, as though they were. And there are some promises that God has given us in His Word um, that are ours, man. They, they are ours. It's just the, the problem is we don't know them. Many Christians, many people do not know the promises of God, like what is available to them, and therefore they just live beneath the promises of God. They, they, they're, leaving, they're leaving a lot on the table, man, when there's so much more available for the child of God. So we're just grabbing some of those promises. We're getting three of them. Today's the last installment of the series because next week is what? Christmas at Discovery. That's right. Christmas at Discovery next week. It's already coming, man. We got six services coming up next Sunday, you guys. I'm really excited about it. I'll tell you more about that. But let me kind of uh, pull us into week three, this final installment. Week number one, if you missed it, it was like a foundation teaching. You got to go check that out because really provided a framework for the rest of these promises. We said that we can prophesy the promises over our fear. We talked about slaying the giants in our life, and that there's some giants in our life that are intimidating us and causing fear and maybe even producing insecurities within our, and doubts within our life. And you can slay those giants of fear in your life by prophesying the promises of God. That was week one. Last week, we talked about prophesying the promises over our finances, that God actually has promised something. It's, it's the most promised part or uh, uh, the, the, most of the promises that God says in the Bible are about your finances and connected to your generosity. So we talked about that last week, prophesying the promise over your finances. Today, we're going to talk about prophesying the promises over your future. And this comes at a timely, I think a timely part of our year here as we're winding down 2019. Y'all ready for 2020? Yes. We're ready for 2020. I'm excited. This is like, I come alive. November, December, January. It's like, this is my time of year, man. I love Thanksgiving and Christmas, everything that those things represent. I love going into the new year, wrapping up one year, the expectation and anticipation of a new year. It represents a clean slate, a blank canvas, man. And I'm like, it just excites me so much. I am a lot. But I get, I get though that for a lot of people, it's not. This is not an exciting time of the, the year. In a time where it should be filled with hope, because that's what Christmas represents. And that's what, that's what a new year and a fresh start should represent. A lot of people, um, history has proven some things. And, and, you know, why would it be different this time? Why would another year be different? Or maybe the things that we're uh, experiencing in this holiday season isn't as good as they used to be because we don't have the same people to experience them with. So I recognize that. This message is for anyone today who, who is having a hard time looking with hope into the future. It's for anyone today that, that has, has, has uh, that, that when you think about your future, maybe it fills you with any anxiety or worry or doubt for whatever reason. It could be relational or financial. It, it could be anything. But, but this message, I hope today, will inspire you to believe some things about your future um, that God has said about your future. To not buy into what, what the past, what, what past mistakes and the past has told you or what other people are telling you, but what God says about your future. Here's Psalm 119, you guys. We're going to start here in 114. It says, you're my refuge and shield and your promises are my only source of what? Of hope. That's, that's the only source. Your promises are the only source of, of hope. I'm not going to put my hope in my health because my health ain't going to be around forever. Hey, in this world, everything's going to fall apart one way. It's going to fall apart someday, okay? It's going to start going the wrong direction someday. Some of you, I don't know if you're, what side of the hill you're on, but once you get to a certain age, it, starts, it just starts going the other way. Ain't nothing you can do about it, okay? So you don't put your hope in your health. You don't put your hope in your, in your wealth. You don't put your hope in relationships or in people. That's not where we, even people, even people that God has called us to be in covenant relationship with, spouses and kids, yeah, have covenant with them, have unconditional love for those people, but that is not where we anchor our hope. The word of God says, Lord, your word, what you have said, God, what you have promised to me is the only source of my 
hope. I'm only going to anchor my soul to your word and your promises, God. It's the only stable thing. It's the only thing that's not going to change. My health will change. My financial outlook will change. The relationships will change. One day those kids will grow up and, and will leave you, parent. They will. That's going to happen. I don't care. You, go, you try to hitch on to that thing, and I promise you, they will reject you all the more. Okay? Eventually, they're going to, look, nothing is certain. Nothing is forever. The only thing that is certain, the only thing that is forever is God's word. Amen? It's God's word. I don't care how long you've been serving God or how faithful you are, though. You're going to come up into circumstances, maybe even seasons of your life, that, that feel hopeless. Now, I'm not pro like I'm not prophesying nothing bad over you. I'm just saying that like, you're going to go through some storms. You're going to go through some trials where it's going to be difficult to, to think of and imagine a future reality different from the impact of what I'm experiencing. This storm or this fire or this trial is difficult for me to imagine a reality where this is not tainted it, where this experience, where this hardship, where this, this broken heart, where this, this difficulty is tainting my perspective of the future. No matter how long you've been walking with God, there's gonna, you're going to come up against times where it feels like that. John the Baptist was, was someone who was a, a, one of the most faithful people of his time. He, was, he recognized Jesus as a Messiah. He was, the Bible calls him the forerunner of Christ. He recognized Jesus as the Messiah before everybody. He said, hey, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He knew it. He's the one who baptized the Jesus in the, in the Jordan River. And here we see just shortly after that, John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 11 was in prison. See, you're going to come up, you're going to come to some situations and seasons where it don't look right. Where it's like, wait a second, God, how'd I get here? How was this part of your plan? John the Baptist was faithful and found himself in prison. And he heard about all the things that the Messiah was doing from prison. Oh, look at the law, hearing about all the stuff. So what did he do? He sent, the Bible says, his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah? At one point, John the Baptist believed that. He was the only one who believed it. While he was baptizing Jesus in the river, he, he, he heard the voice. He saw the dove descend like a Holy Spirit. And the voice of heaven say, Behold, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. He knew it. He knew beyond a shadow of a doubt. He knew in that moment that Jesus was the Messiah. But because of his prison experience, he started to doubt. And he sensed him as, Oh, wait a second. Is this, I don't get it. Because what I'm experiencing right now in the prison doesn't seem like you're the Messiah, because this doesn't fit into my plan. This doesn't fit into what I think I would be experiencing. Are you the Messiah we've been expecting, or should we be looking for someone else? Should we be looking? And that's what cir your circumstances will do with you. It, it'll cause you, look at this, this is a foundation for, for where we're going today. I need you to see this, you guys. Write it down this way. A prison perspective will always cause you to doubt your destiny. A prison perspective will always cause you to doubt your your destiny. Because John the Baptist was behind some bars and he was in prison, he doubted the destiny that God had for his life. Now look, just because you're in a fire, just because you're in a trial, doesn't mean you need to adopt the perspective of your circumstance. Because really, listen, that trial, that difficulty, that prison that you're in, that hardship that you're in, please hear me, that is not your prison. The real prison is up here. The real prison is in is in your mind. Just because you are in a trial doesn't mean you have to have the perspective of the trial. Doesn't, it doesn't have to alter your, your perspective. See, the Apostle Paul is someone who's a different example. The Apostle Paul lived a lot of his life in prison, and he wrote some letters. We call the letters that, that in the New Testament that Paul, the Apostle Paul wrote the prison epistles. He wrote many of them, and he wrote about joy and love and gratitude. He wrote from the prison, rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. He wrote from prison, I have learned to be content in all circumstances from prison. Paul, the reason why he was able to do that is because he looked at his life, not through the lens of his circumstances, but through the lens of his faith. And just because you are in the fire and just because you're, you're in a prison doesn't mean you need to adopt the perspective of the prison. It will rob you of your destiny. It will cause you to doubt your destiny. And your perspective will either become 
your prison or your passport? Come on, someone receive that, okay? Your, your perspective. See, that, that, again, that trial is not the prison. That circumstance that you're in, that difficulty, that's not the prison. Your perspective of the trial will either become the prison or the passport that breaks the shackles, that opens the doors, of, that opens the prison doors where you are set free. So what I hope to do today, because what you look at in your life, you can, you can come into seasons and circumstances like John the Baptist and go, this doesn't make sense. Because the, the, the fact is, here's the fact, the fact is he's, he's chained. The fact is his freedom was taken away, he's in prison. That is a fact. Here's what I want to do today. I want to present you with some different facts to put your faith into. That some different facts that are, not, that are not circumstantial, that are not dependent upon the reality that you experience, but some facts that God has for you about your future that I hope that you, that you shift from your hope putting in the circumstances of this world that you put it in God's promises. There's some different facts that you just need to start putting your faith in instead of the, instead of the circumstances that you may be experiencing today. So let me start. before I'm going to end the service with giving you some guarantees, some of the promises about your future. You can prophesy. But first, I need to give you some new facts to believe in today, okay? Here they are. Write them down. Number one, here's the first fact. God knows everything that's going to happen. God knows everything that will happen in my life, your life, this world. This is called the omniscience of God. God is omniscient. That word just means he's, he's all-knowing. Do you know God is never surprised? That's what that means. God is never surprised. You never surprise God. You never shock God. Anything you say or do could never shock God. God knows everything. He knows everything you're going to say. He knows everything you're going to do. He knows every thought that you're going to think. And he already, check this out, he already knows the end. You know why? Because God is timeless. God does not exist in time. He is above time. He is the beginning and the end, the Bible says, the alpha and the omega. Hebrews chapter 4, 13 says like this, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before his eye. You know what this verse says? This verse is saying that there are no secrets with God. Okay, I, I wonder how many of us are foolishly thinking we're keeping secrets from God. I talk to people all, all, all the time. I was actually this last week, I went and visited some, a group of people that have been um, in, a, in a counseling group and, and they, don't, they don't go to church anywhere but they're, they're, they're kind of here's, here's, here's what they all all of them said a similar thing if I go to church the church will burn down <laughs> oh I can't, I can't I can't go to church I don't know some of you may be here today or even watching online and you think you know what I can't go to church or maybe you've been you've been not attending or going to a church or away or distancing yourself from God thinking that God somehow does not see what you're doing anyway. Oh, I can't go to church. Then God will find out what's really going on in my life. I can't, I got to dis, look, God, nothing. You cannot keep a secret from God. There's no secrets. God knows every good. God knows every bad in my life, every sin in my life, every ugly thought in my life, and check it out. He chose to love me anyway. Unconditionally, he loves you. That's God. That's how good he is. He knows everything about us. Psalm 139 says that the days allotted to me, look, God knows everything about your future. Check it out. The days are allotted to you. You have a number. God knows it. A number of the days. They've all been recorded also in your book before any of them ever began. Before I ever took a breath, God wrote my story. God knew my future. God knew the actions and the choices and, and, and the missteps. He knew it. He knew it all before I ever took a breath. I don't mean to get political on you or anything like that, but this is why abortion is wrong, church. Okay, I don't, I'm not getting up in anyone's face, and I'm not, this is not a political platform. I just want you to know that life begins not in the womb, but in the mind of God. That's when life begins. God knows everything that will happen. That's a fact. That is a fact that you need to start putting your hope into. Here's the second fact. God's plan for my future is good. Hey, it's not bad. Don't buy that. Don't buy that, that your future somehow is going to turn out bad. I don't care what mistakes you made or missteps that you've made. 
God, look, because God is a good God, he doesn't make bad plans. He doesn't. There is no God does not, has never made a bad plan in his entire existence. Why? Because he's good. All he makes is good plans. That's all he has for you. All God has for you is good plans. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. God says, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and to what? God thinks about your life more than you think about your life. He does. God thinks about your future more than you've thought about your future. And some of you, some of you don't think about it enough. Some of you are just going through life, letting life happen to you, and you ain't got a plan at all, and you need to get on God's plan, amen? God, his plan for my future is good. And some people will ask sometimes, we're talking about God's future, he knows it, all the days were ordained in my... Well, some say, well, can I miss God's plan then? Can I miss? Here's, of course you can. Abs- absolutely you can. In fact, most people do miss God's plan. You know why? Because you have to choose God's plan for your life. Hey, God's plan for your life is not going to happen automatically. It's not going to just show up and materialize automatically. You have to choose God's will and choose God's plan. If you read the rest of this Jeremiah, and can I give you some homework, you guys? Let me give you some homework. Go read Jeremiah 29, start from verse 1, read it all. Here's what you're going to find out right before this verse where God says, I know the plans I have for you. He's, he's, there's actually false prophets in Israel that are prophesying peace when there was no peace. They're saying, oh, God's going to rescue. God's going to deliver. He's going to come to your aid. And God said, you go read it. God said, I didn't tell them to say that. They're false prophets. There is no aid coming to you until you give me your whole heart. I will not be found by you. He says, once you seek me with your whole heart, then you will find me. Because God says, I know the plans I have for you. You're just not choosing them. You're just not, you're not taking my way. See, you can't prophesy the promises unless you what? Practice the principles. That what we, that's what we've been saying. Look, God knows that my future is good, but that leads to this next fact right here. I got to choose it though. I got to choose God's plan. I got to choose to trust and obey God. You see, God didn't create puppets or robots. He created humans with free will. God didn't want a puppet. He wanted wanted children. He wanted a godly inheritance, a legacy. He wanted children that would choose to love him. So God goes, hey, you can choose to love me or you can choose not to love me. Hey, you can choose my plan for your life or you can run your way you can do your plan if you think you know better you can go ahead and fulfill that for your life unfortunately most people in the world make the wrong choice most people in the world think they have a better plan you want to know what what gets you from missing god's plan What, what 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 prevents us from stepping into the future that god has written that god has ordained for us you know what it is it's one word pride pride will prevent you from your purpose here's what pride says pride says i know god has a plan i know he's god he's creator but i know what makes me happy i know what makes me happy and i know what i want and what i would prefer so i'm going to disobey now you may not logically think of it that way but that's what we do i'm going to disobey i'm going to disregard i'm going to whatever you do i'm going to pretend whatever and i'm i'm going to do what makes me happy pride prevents you from walking in your purpose you gotta choose to trust and obey. can i just i want to encourage you too if you choose this if you choose to trust and obey god you can't miss your purpose you can't okay because i don't want you to live with fear and go oh my god am i gonna miss this person am i gonna miss? no if you choose to trust and obey god if you choose say god whatever you say whatever you call me to i'm saying yes and amen god i'm going all in for you i don't care if it's unpopular i don't care if it's countercultural. i don't care if it's uncomfortable whatever you have for me god i'm saying yes you cannot miss god's purpose for your life but you got to choose it you have to choose it because it's not automatic deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19 god says it like this today i'm giving you a choice you see, God's, God's not going to, he's not going to force you, church. He's not. You're, not. you're not a robot. You're not a puppet. 
God's not going not to force you. He's going to present you with a choice. Why? Because you're his daughter. You're a son. You're not a robot. You're a son. You're a daughter. He says, today I'm presenting you with a choice between life and death. A choice between blessings and curses. And then he says, I'm going to call heaven and earth as a witness. As, they're going to witness your choice here. So choose life. And there's an exclamation mark there because in that Hebrew that it's written in, it's actually, there's, there's, some of your Bibles have a, an O in there. It's, it's this groan of God. Oh, that you would, it's almost this, that God, this is God, like his heart is breaking for you. He's almost begging you as his son and daughter, as a, as, as a mother or a father would see the, the, their son or daughter making some choices they shouldn't make, turning their back. And as a father, a harder father going, oh, that you would choose a different road, my son. Oh, that you would choose life, that you would choose blessings over curses. Then you and your children will live, he says. Now, we've come back to this because part one in this message series has become very foundational. But something I told you in part one, I said that your children will either inherit what? God's promises or your fear. They're going to inherit that. And some of you are so afraid of your future. You're so afraid. You're so anxious and worried. And I'm going to talk to you about that and what you can put your trust in. But some of us are passing down anxiety to our children instead of the promises of God that we can put our hope into. Amen? Here's the next fact that you could put your hope into. Hey, God's going to be with me every step of the way. In my future, you see, I don't, I don't know what it's going to be like. I don't, and I don't have control of it, but I do know this. God will be with me every step of the way in my future. Man, you can trust in that church. That should fill you with, with faith and hope and encouragement. And how do we know that God is going to be here with us every step of the way? Because it's one of, the most, one of the most repeated promises in the Bible. God says over and over and over, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will go with you. My presence will go. I, I will go. God says over and over again that he will go with you. You know why? Because you were created for fellowship with God. You were created to have communion and connection with God. Now, you may not always feel God's presence, but thank God he's not a feeling. Something doesn't have to be felt for it to be real. Amen? God says, I will be with you wherever you go. Hebrews chapter 13 is one of those promises. Keep your lives free from the love of money. We talked about that last week and how important that is, man. And be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, and never will I forsake you. So because of that, because of that promise, we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be what? I'm not going to be afraid. What can people do to me? What, what, can, what does the future have? Look, every fear, every fear in our life is a misunderstanding of who God is and what he's promised. I want you to receive that. Every fear that you are experiencing, every anxiety, every worry is a misunderstanding of who God is and what God has promised. If you knew what God is really like, if you knew what God has promised you and you trusted in that promise, here's the reality, you would not be anxious for tomorrow. You would rejoice. That's the reality. And maybe those anxieties and fears reveal that our hope is hitched onto the wrong thing. That we need to start trusting in the facts God says about my future instead of what I'm thinking or what I'm feeling or what the circumstances seem to be about my future. Okay. There are six promises I want to give you today that, that are going to expel, that can expel every fear, that can expel every anxiety, that, that when you think about your future, if, if there is worry or if you choose to not only trust them, but declare them over your future, prophesy these promises of God into your future, I'm telling you, you don't have to live with that fear. You don't have to live with that anxiety anymore. Amen, church? Okay, here are the guarantees, six guarantees of God for my future. Number one, God promises to guide me when I'm confused. In your future, you're going to have some difficult decisions to make. Some of them are going to be confusing. You're going to, you're going to have decisions like, do I take this job? Do I move 
to this city? Do I marry this girl? Do I take that promotion? What, where do you go to? Where do you turn to when you are confused, when you're faced with a difficult decision? Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. A lot of you know this one. Trust in the Lord with, and there's that theme again, all your heart. Look, it doesn't work any other way, guys. God says, you got to go all in. you got to give me all your heart. And when you do, I will be found, in, found by you. Trust in the Lord, not with part of your heart, not with part of your faith, not with part of your future. Trust in the Lord. With all your heart, never rely on what you think you know. Oh, I love that, man. Because you get, you get caught up in what you think you know, right? Oh, because this is what I see. This is what my reality is. Don't get caught up in what you think you know. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Remember the Lord in everything you do, and he will show you the right way. Where do you, we know that God has a plan. We know that there's a right way, but we often don't. He's not the first place we turn to. It's a promise. God promises he's going to guide me when I'm confused. But when I'm confused or I'm faced with a difficult decision, most of us don't go to the source. We go to maybe a friend. We call a lifeline, right? Let me, and that's okay. With the multitude of counselors, the Bible says plans succeed because of that. And they fail without them. So it's, it's okay. But we need to know that God says, look, my, my word is your guiding light, not your friends. Here, listen. If you want to know God's will, you got to know God's word. You got to. You, so, so let me say this again. You can't prophesy the promises if you don't practice the principles. But check it out. You can't practice the principles if you haven't pursued diligent study of those principles. Are you hearing me, guys? Some, some of these principles of God's word, you, you, you're, not even, you're, you're not practicing them because you don't even know them. They're there. They're for you. And some of us are living in, in blind ignorance, out of step with God just because we haven't pursued diligently his word for our life. Oh, are you receiving this, you guys? Amen. God promises to guide me when I'm confused. He's going to guide me. Where is he going to get that guidance from? Sure, from the Holy Spirit, from his presence. But his will is found in his word. Diligently study and pursue the principles of God to be your guiding light. He promises to guide us when we're confused. Here's the second promise. Guarantee. Number two, God promises to help me when I'm tempted. Okay, here's another, like, guarantee. <laughs> The, every promise is kind of a guarantee here. Yeah, God promises to, to help me when I'm tempted, but let me give you a guarantee. You will be tempted in your future. You're going to be tempted in, in your future. It's, it's going to happen. You can get better at resisting the temptation, but the temptation itself, temptation, will never go away. It will never. You will always be tempted. Some of you have thought, oh, man, if I get more mature, though, get more mature in my faith and my walk with God... I'll be less tempted. In fact, I found it to be kind of the opposite. I think, because the, look, Satan ain't going to mess with you if you ain't making a difference in nobody's life, but you start making a difference in fulfilling your purpose in this world, now you got his attention. Amen? Some of you are carrying around false shame because you think, oh, I shouldn't be feeling this. I shouldn't be tempted like this. I shouldn't be thinking these, these thoughts are feeling this way, and that's just not true, man. You're not even responsible for every thought that comes to your mind. You're responsible for what you do with the thought. Are you taking it captive? Or are you fantasizing and fixating? See, that's where we get into lusting. Look, temptation alone is not a sin. Let me say it this way. Attraction is not sin. Action is. You're going to be attracted. You're human. You're going to be attracted to things. Every time that commercial comes on about pizza, Care what, I don't care what kind of pizza, but there's something that God created inside of me that I'm just attracted to some pizza, you guys. I don't know what it is for you. It's all different. Everyone's different. Everyone has different attractions, and just because you are attracted to something that, that is good or pretty or whatever, just because you're attracted to that type of person, that type, look, look, there are some things that you can do to create healthy boundaries and create a healthy thought life and all that stuff. There are some things you can do, but you'll never be rid of temptation. You know why? Because this world is evil. It's full of sin and wickedness. And, and, and so the temptation is always going to be here. First Corinthians chapter 10 talks about that. Remember that the temptations that come into your life are no different from what others experience. You're not experiencing anything that I experience. We're going through the same thing. We all deal with temptation and attraction. 
But God's faithful. Amen, somebody? God is faithful. When I'm not, God is faithful. He will keep the temptation from becoming so strong that you can't stand up against it. When you're tempted, he will show you a way out so you will not give into it. Every now and then I'll have someone tell me, oh, pastor, I stumbled, I fell. I just couldn't help it, though. The temptation was too strong. It, just, it was just too much. I know right there they're not being honest with themselves. They're not. Because God says, I will not allow temptation to grow beyond something that you can't bear. I'll, I'll provide you a way out. Here, the reality is they're not being honest. You didn't want a way out. You wanted it. That's what it boils down to. Because God said, I'll give you a way of escape. And there is. There is always a way out. God promises to help me win I'm tempted. Not if, but when I'm tempted. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. The Lord is, what's that word again? He's faithful. Aren't you glad that God is faithful, man? That God is faithful when we are sometimes not. God is faithful and he will give you strength and will protect you from the evil one. See, some of those thoughts, they're not even your thoughts. Some of them are the arrows of the enemy. Some of you need to, you need to, you need to take captive some of those thoughts and bring them to the obedience, those strongholds, bring them into the obedience of, do you know that, look, why are you afraid of Satan? Why are you afraid of the evil one? No weapon formed against you shall prosper. You have no fear. No fear of your future should be because of Satan or the evil one. None of his influence, okay? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The only thing for the Christian, you're a child of God today, the only thing the enemy can give you is a suggestion. That's it. He can't, he can't take over you. He can't make you do nothing. All he can do is present you with a choice. Life, death, blessings, curses. It comes in the form of a lie. And you have the choice to believe that lie. If it's going to make you happy, if it's going to make you fulfilled, if it's going to satisfy. Sometimes we buy into the lie. And that's what sucks, sinks his hooks into us. But all Satan, all the enemy can do is offer suggestions. Here's the third promise. You get anything out of this today, you guys? Amen? Here's the third promise, okay? God promises to support me in trouble. God promises, now what's the difference between temptation and trouble? Temptation is inside of me. Trouble is outside of me. Temptation has to do with my character. Trouble has to do with my circumstances. See, and this is another guarantee of God. Jesus guaranteed, in this world, you will have trouble. It's going to happen. But Isaiah 43, God promises some things. He says, when? you go through. Not if. Not if you go through stuff. No, God says, you're going to go through some stuff. You're going to. It's going to happen. This world, when you go through deep waters and great trouble. We don't like that promise, do we? We don't like that. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. God's going to produce something out of that trouble, too. I promise you that. God, when you go through the deep waters and great trouble, God says, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned, for I am the Lord your God. God, listen, you're going to get wet. You're just not going to drown. You're going you're gonna, to, you're gonna, it's going to get hot. You're just not going to get burned, okay? God has some promises in his word. Philippians chapter 4, 13 says, that I love the amplified version of this. He says, I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I am ready for anything and equal to anything, not because of my strength, but through him who infuses inner strength in me. Amen? Amen. Some of you say, wow, well, oh, man, I'm afraid of my future because what if this happens and what if that happens? I don't know if I'm strong enough to do what God's called me to do. Listen, the strength will come the day you need the strength. That's when it will come. God, God is not going to give you, God doesn't give me strength today for tomorrow's problems. God does not give me strength today for next year's plans that he has for my life. That's not the way God works. Look, Jesus said, when, he didn't say, when you pray, pray like this. Give me this week my weekly bread. <laughs> give me this month my monthly bread, God. No, God says, give me what? This. Give me this day. Look here, as you trust in the promises of God and you walk in faith, the moment you step out into the unknown, the strength will come when you get there. Yeah, when, the moment that you step in faith, God promises, I'll give you strength in the time that you need it. Not before it, not ever after it, but at the right time when you need it. Amen? Fourth promise, fourth guarantee. God promises to repay those who hurt me. Come on, let's camp out right here for a moment. Amen, somebody? Ooh, baby. Ooh, baby. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. 
that's not the right heart here. Okay. Uh, here's, here's the right heart, y'all, is if, you're, if you take it in your hands, you're taking it out of God's hands. That's, right. that's the heart, okay? And it's never meant to be in your hands. Vengeance isn't yours. That's right. God says vengeance is mine. Romans chapter 12, verse 19. God says this, never avenge yourselves. Leave that to God, for he has said that he will repay those who deserve it. God says that. And some of us, listen, some of you are carrying around offenses, hurts, and things that people did to you, thinking you're paying them back for it. Some of you are carrying around things 10 years, or maybe when you were kids, you're still carrying around stuff, thinking that, that it's, you carrying around your memory, that garbage, that, 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 can I just tell you just honestly, that is so dumb. That is dumb to be carrying that junk around, that garbage around. You're not hurting anybody but yourself. Nobody. It's not harming them at all. You're only harming yourself. You're not meant to carry that garbage around with you. You know, there's a promise. There is a promise that the Hannish family trusts in. We trust in this promise. It's a good promise, man. We put our, we put our trust in this promise. And here it is. Here's this promise. If we take the garbage out on Monday, it disappears on Tuesday. Hallelujah, somebody. Come on. If we take the garbage out on Monday, it is it removed from our life as far as the east, well, wherever they dump it, but as far, it's gone. It's gone. One day, Caleb, I'm teaching Caleb responsibility. He's got different chores. And so one day I was telling him to take out the trash and move the trash to the sidewalk. He's big enough now. He can carry that thing, man, and carry it to the, to the sidewalk. I say, hey, go take the, throw out the trash and then take it. But I woke up the next morning and I found every one on my block, the whole block, the, the, the trashes were, trash cans were empty. All the garbage was taken except for mine. Because mine was on the sidewalk and not the street. You see, the problem here, and I hope I'm, I'm not dovetailing too much, but the problem here is that Caleb just didn't know the principle. And I wonder how many of us just don't know the principles of God, that we're carrying around garbage that he didn't, he, didn't, he doesn't want us to, to carry junk that it was never meant to be part of our life. And if we just knew what God said, God says, I will remove that stuff as far as the east is from the west. If you just, and here we are, we're the neighbor now that everybody's, we're stinking up the neighborhood. Why? Just because we didn't take the garbage out. Some of you are holding on to stuff that's just stinking up your life. It's garbage you weren't ever meant to, you, all you need to do is take it out to that street, I promise you. God will remove that junk from your life, Amen. Here's the fifth, the fifth promise. God promises to reward my service. God promises to reward. Now, we don't serve to get, nothing like that, but this is just how good God is. God is a rewarding God, and he promises this. God promises to reward your service, and that's one of the reasons why, like, we want you, and we have this whole, like, part of our design and plan here at Discovery is to help you discover your purpose and get you to serve others because, listen, if you unselfishness is the beginning of understanding true love Amen. if if you cannot learn servanthood if you can't learn how to be unselfish and meet somebody else's need and serve somebody else's need you will never know what love is unselfishness is the beginning point it's the starting point if you are a selfish person a prideful person you do not know love nor can you operate in love that's why it's so important for you to serve uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10, says this, that God's not unfair. He's, gonna, he's not going to forget how hard you've worked for him and how you have shown your love for him. How, God? How do we work hard for you? How do we show our love for you? By helping his people. Oh, but me and God are good. I got a good relationship with God. I love God so much, and he loves me. Okay, but, but God says, the way you love me is you love my people. You want to love me? You want to, what are you going to do? What, do you, what can you give me? God is going. What do you think you can give me? You want to love me? Love my people. Serve my people. Be unselfish. Stop trying to get all your needs met and thinking all about yourself and serve my people. And, and, and then he says, and continue to do so. Don't ever forget it. Remember, God is a rewarder of my service. Number six. Here's the last one. I got to hurry. God promises to give me a home in heaven. When your future is uncertain or unsure, 
this is a promise that you can, you can declare. God, this is, and this is, hey, this is one of those unconditional promises. If you're a child of God, there's nothing that can take this home away from you, you guys. As long as you trust and obey, as long as you put your faith in Him, this is a promise. God promises to give me a home in heaven. I love Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, and we're going to pray. I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. Check it out. Being confident of this, He who began a good work in you, what does He say He'll do? He's going to carry it out to completion. Look, God not only started the work, but he promises, I'll carry it through. I started it, and I will carry you through to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He's talking about heaven. God says, I will carry you through all the way to my promise of a home in heaven. Can I pray for you, church? Come on, let's bow our heads and close our eyes right there. Some of you are here today. And